Hey everyone, I hope you're hungry. Today's show is about cooking and eating outside. We have a powerhouse team of experts on today's show, including Brad Leone of Bon Appetit and Brendan Leonard and Anna Branas, authors of Best Serve Wild. But first, a little background. One of my favorite parts of camping and hiking is eating on the trail. Everything tastes 10 times better when you're enjoying it outside after a long day of hiking or surfing. In fact, the food I ate on a camping trip made me fall in love with camping in the first place. It was my first multi-day adventure. I was a sophomore in high school on the surf team. The mom of a teammate took us camping for three nights on the beach. We surfed all day, then came in to eat homemade spaghetti and meatballs over fire, tacos, and the most delicious food. It was the most incredible thing to surf all day, then fill up on the most delicious, yummy food. One of my favorite memories as a kid is when my stepdad took us camping and he'd make us Rocky Mountain Toast, also known as egg in the hole or toad in the hole, where you basically cut a hole in your toast, crack an egg into it, and it's still one of my favorite things to eat outside. But last year, I went on an all-woman's overnight adventure with REI and apparently I forgot everything I learned as a kid. I'd been focusing so much on this lightweight hiking training All I brought to eat were some rice cakes with almond butter, a packet of instant soup, and some oatmeal cookies. (laughs) When the other woman started busting out water bottles filled with tasty beverages and the ingredients to make fajitas, I was so embarrassed to show them what I'd brought. Luckily, they were kind enough to share, and that's one of my favorite things about enjoying a meal in the outdoors. It brings people together. It's so much easier to cook a group meal for one person to man the fire and make sure the coals are hot while another chops the ingredients and another tells the stories. And it's not only a long day of physical activity that makes the food taste so good, it's also knowing you contributed something to make a nourishing meal. I'm Shelby Stanger and this is Wild Ideas Worth Living. When you've spent all day outside, you want to eat something that's filling, delicious, and comes together fast. Things like peanut butter, tortillas, and spices, they're essential, but what do you do with them to make them into a meal? What produce can I put into my pack that I'll keep for a few days without getting limp and bruised at the bottom of my bag? I wanted to talk to some experts about what kind of foods work best in the outdoors. The authors of a cookbook called Best Serve Wild, a book about cooking and eating in the backcountry, are sure to have plenty of tricks for making food taste great outside. It was written by my friend Brendan Leonard, an ultra runner, creative, and hiker who spends a lot of time thinking about food as fuel, and his friend Anna Branas, an author and chef who's done a lot of bike touring and focuses on eating nutritious whole foods. Anna's outlook on both food and nature was very much influenced by her upbringing in the Pacific Northwest and her Swedish mother who taught her not only how to cook, but placed a lot of value on spending time outside. Now, as an author and artist with plenty of cookbooks under her belt, Anna has a passion for slowing down both our food and our lives. Also a note, you'll hear a couple of these experts talk about umami. It's the fifth flavor, the main four being salty, sweet, bitter, and sour. And it's the Japanese word for savory. So when you hear them talking about umami, which of course is my favorite word to say, umami, think of sautéed mushrooms, miso soup, or grated parmesan. Can you tell us a little bit about your background in food and food writing and sort of what you do? Sure. So I do a lot of things. Um, I'm a writer and an artist and a producer, and I have always cooked food at home. Um, Grew up in a a household with a mother who came from Sweden and a dad from the U.S. And um, my mom was just really adamant about making pretty much everything at home. So I was always helping in the kitchen. And I don't have enough formal food training or anything, but I just got into food writing sort of as one does. And I've done several cookbooks, including Best Served Wild with Brendan. Also done a book called Fika, The Art of the Swedish Coffee Break. I um, have a book called The Culinary Cyclist, which is sort of the intersection of slow food and slow life. So I just I just love food as a way to connect people and a way to slow down and be present. And I just really like experimenting with food, whether I'm at home or outside. So I grew up um, sort of a non-traditional American <laughs> upbringing, I guess. Um, we always ate a lot of like whole grains and vegetables growing up. Meanwhile, all of my friends were... I don't know, bringing like bologna sandwiches to school. 
And I had like sandwiches with sprouts, which were very untradeable. But um, yeah, I was just always like just made a grew up in the country and just made a lot of stuff at home. I mean, I think Swedish food and Swedish cooking is very sort of simple and down to earth. And that's just kind of like how I grew up. And so I was always helping my mom in the kitchen and was always excited about that and didn't really didn't really realize that that was like a special thing. Probably until after college when I just cooked a lot and I didn't really I sort of started realizing that a lot of my friends didn't necessarily do a lot of cooking or didn't really know a lot about cooking. So at that point I started, I was working at an online magazine and I started doing some, um, some food writing and doing some weekly recipes for that blog. And that kind of grew and developed into a, to a a career in writing about food. Oh, that's so cool. You know, it's funny because as you sit here and tell this story, I'm thinking the person who taught me how to cook and like finally made me realize that I was such a terrible cook was a roommate I had in Costa Rica from Sweden and she could just cook everything and she would cook like pancakes from scratch and I was like how do you do that and she would just look at me like I was crazy she's like it's flour and water (laughs) and like some butter and I was like oh I didn't know I just used a box when I was a kid yeah yeah it's funny I mean you know I, I think it's we all have different entry points for food right but we all eat we all have to eat to survive. And so that's why I think food is such a great like common denominator and it's really a great way to come together for people. Um, but I think, yeah, we all come at it from very different backgrounds. And so I have a lot of friends that are really excited about cooking but did not grow up cooking. I mean, my husband, he loves to cook, loves food, and he grew up on like baked bean sandwiches. He's from Australia and baked bean sandwiches are apparently a thing, which sound terrible to me. They're cold. That's so gross. I've never had one. It sounds awful. <laughs> So what's your relationship to the outdoors? You seem like a pretty active human. <laughs> well, I grew up in the Northwest. And like I said, um, Swedish mom, American dad. I think Swedish culture has a lot of just nature in the everyday. So I would say that I just grew up in the country and um, on a piece of property and just spent most of my, well, it's the Northwest. So whenever it was fairly nice out, I um, would be outside. Definitely was just like running around barefoot all summer long. Um, I was a camp counselor for a long time. So I was really excited about getting kids outside. And I just, yeah, being outside has just always been part of my sort of everyday existence. I was just having a conversation with somebody recently about, you know, in this world where a lot of people have very extreme outdoor routines or, you know, it's like they're climbers or rafters or whatever. There's this sort of like push for bigger, better, you know, um, getting a personal record on a certain route or that kind of a thing. But I think for me, like the really the important thing about being outside is just that moment of presence. So whatever the activity is, it's just about slowing down and being in the moment and just being aware of my surroundings. And that's kind of like, that's the most important thing to me when I'm outside. Well said. I mean, that's sort of what we're trying to push right now is we're trying to expand at least this year for me. I had a lot of really, you know, extreme rock climbers and ultra runners on the first and second year. And this year, I've just wanted to expand the definition of adventure, but part of adventure is eating. And I'd love to talk to you about (laughs) food outside because that's what the show is about. It's about cooking outside. So talk Mm -hmm. to me about your experience cooking outside and your cookbook. And then I want to get into the details. Yeah. Well, I think like with anything that we do, if, if we do something fairly regularly and it's just sort of part of our normal activity, we don't really think of that as special or particularly different. And I think Just like I grew up cooking food, I think making food outside and just experimenting with food outside has always been something that I've done. So, you know, when I I have a lot of friends now, they're like, what should I make outside? And I'm like, I don't know. Just like, what do you have with you? Just like experiment. But it's such a, for me, that's just always been, I've always loved experimenting at home. And I think spending a lot of time on camping trips with my parents when I grew up, I mean, we'd always have really good food. I remember specifically on a trip along, I think we were on the Oregon coast um, and my mom had made this like... It was like a pine nut couscous apricot salad thing that she made, like on trail. And I just have that really, yeah, I just have this really distinct memory of that meal, which I love. And then there's a few other sort of as I was younger, there's things that stick out. Like I, so I went to this YMCA camp for a long time. And uh, when I was in sixth grade, three days of that two weeks, you got to go on this overnight backpacking trip. And I remember that one of the things was uh, pancakes is like a really, you know, just common kind of backpacking camp food, right? Just, it's like a mix and add water. And uh, one of the counselors had M&Ms with them. And that was like the special thing was you got to put the M&Ms in the pancakes. And uh, 
at the, you know, in sixth grade, you're actually technically not allowed to like be on the stoves. Like the counselors are supposed to do it. But I was like, I've grown up camping and I know I'm around a stove. And they're like, well, if you want to make the pancakes on it, like have at it. So I was just like making all the pancakes for everyone on the trip, <laughs> which is just a memory that sticks out. M&Ms and pancakes. That's like a really good addition. I'm going to have to try it's that It's like one. a... Yeah, it's, I mean, it's pretty simple, right? Yeah, it's it not sounds too delicious. complicated. Um, yeah, but it's like, that's my strategy for cooking outside is like, if you can just find the one simple thing that kind of is a game changer, that's the, the those are the things that kind of take outdoor food, I think, to the, you know, to a different level than just, you know, throwing together something super simple. The thing about food outside, though, is like anything tastes good. <laughs> I mean, you really like any mediocre meal at home, if you make it outside, even if you're just like, at a picnic on a day trip, it's still going to taste better than it did at home. That's the beauty of it. So true. I'm really curious. So what are some of your favorite meals and recipes from the book? Well, it's really funny because, so I get asked a lot by friends, like, what should I make outside? And I really, when I cook on trips, I am usually making approximately the same thing or like a variation of the same thing. So I have, there's a peanut sauce recipe in the book that I make a lot. And I usually don't measure when I'm on trail. So that sauce can taste different at different times. <laughs> What's in the peanut sauce? So it's peanut butter and some soy sauce and some sesame oil, a little bit of rice vinegar if you have it. And then um, if you have it, some some chopped garlic and fresh ginger. And then you add a little. So you kind of do that up. And then at the end, you add water to it, which helps to kind of make in that thickened sauce situation. Yeah. And that's like great on noodles. It's great on vegetables. It's great. In a spoon. I was going to uh, say, I'd eat it plain. You know, <laughs> yeah. And I even make that one at home too. So yum. we love making <laughs> yeah. spring rolls. So I'll have to try that with those. Oh, yum. Yeah. No, that's, that's a, that's a great one. I also think like, I, I feel like the book and even just outside of the book, but how I cook normally if I'm outside, it's really just about like, you know, what ingredients are you going to have with you normally? Because I think sometimes it's easy to be like, okay, I'm going on a trip. I want to make like a fancy thing. And then like all of a sudden you have like 10 ingredients that you sort of, one, don't cook with regularly or two, like would never have with you on a trip. And I think it's fun to sort of play around with things that, you know, like peanut butter is such like a base staple for a lot of people, I think. Same with like trail mix, right? So there's a couple of recipes in the book that use trail mix in a variety of ways, like tossing some in in pancakes because you have it there with you. Tell me a couple more recipes that you love. There's a, uh, there's like a red lentil doll recipe in there. Um, and like lentils. So I do some, I do a lot of bike touring. And so <laughs> when you're bike touring, you can get away with a little bit more weight than you can when you're backpacking. But um, yeah, that one's really, nice. I love that one because those, those red lentils cook up pretty quickly. And then there is a, I really like having dried mushrooms with me when I'm traveling just because they're really, they're lightweight and you can do a lot with them. So there's a, there's just like some, some dried mushrooms and a pasta recipe in there. And that one's kind of fun. The other one that I really like, which is one of these uh, ones that I just kind of came up with one time because I was trying to use up leftovers as I think most of us have done on trips, you know, when you're at like the bottom of the stuff sack and you're like, what in God's name can I do with these dried (laughs) crusts of bread or whatever? But um, on one of those types of trips, I had a bunch of leftover tortillas that were just kind of like corn tortillas. They were just kind of gross, just dried out and yuck. And you just like drizzle them in a ton of olive oil and then fry them up. And they actually end up becoming kind of crispy. So we have this like, I don't remember what the exact title is in the book, but something like trail nachos or something. And uh, so it's just like those plus like whatever hunk of cheese that you still have left. And then like some red pepper flakes on top. (laughs) So there's, there's some game changer ingredients that you can take with you to basically make your food taste a little bit better. One of those was peanut butter. Can you give us a couple more of these like game changing ingredients? Yeah. So I think that the best place to start, it kind of depends on what you cook at home. So I think that the best place to start is by identifying sort of what your favorite things are to make at home. And like, if you, you know, if you make a lot of sort of Asian inspired stir fries at home, well, then something that you can have with you is some soy sauce or some fresh ginger or some even sesame oil if you want to go a little above and beyond. If you, you know, make a lot of more like, I don't know, Italian inspired foods at home, like then maybe you have a spice kit that is like a little bit more in in that direction. So I think it's always about identifying what you make at home and kind of what you're comfortable making at home because 
the trail is like not the time and place to start with an absolutely new recipe. I also think this is the other because you asked about just different ingredients or special ingredients. There's a recipe in the book that I make a lot, which is you toast up. You usually, I usually use almonds, but you can use whatever nuts you want. So you toast up nuts at home or just like do them in a, um, a dry frying pan. And then you add salt and you can even add some spices. And you put that in the food processor and you grind it really finely. And it's just a really nice, it's just a nice thing to put on top of essentially anything. Just kind of has this like nutty, salty flavor to it, which I feel is sort of that kind of umami flavor that we kind of crave when we're outside and, and really hungry. Okay, so here's my problem. My favorite food to eat is like salad and salsa and avocados and guacamole. And like those things are really tough on the trail to take with you. <laughs> my guideline is always to... Figure out a couple of fresh ingredients that are going to keep longer that you can take and add. Because um, I think even when you're using, you know, dehydrated or, or dried meals, it can be really nice to have something fresh with it. So my things that I tend to have are like carrots keep for essentially forever, even if they're at the bottom of your backpack in like 90 degree weather for a week, they're going to be fine. Like I mentioned, fresh ginger is a really good one too. It's just like that one keeps pretty long. Fresh garlic Onions can be really good. Those can keep for a while. So like, unfortunately, salad does not do well. No. <laughs> but I feel like you can have that kind of like freshness flavor from carrots, for example. And I think it's sort of identifying like a couple just fresh items that you can add that will that will change up a meal a little bit and make you just feel a little bit better about what you're eating. And I find that, you know, dried veggies do the trick. So I can find dried peas, dried carrots, but probably dehydrating them yourself is is probably the way to go. Yeah. And I actually haven't, um, I don't have a dehydrator and I haven't really experimented because there's actually, I know a lot of people that do their own, you know, like they'll make chili at home and then dehydrate it and then get to undehydrate or hydrate it back on the trail. Um, that's pretty nuts. The one thing that I do at home pretty often is I make my own dried apples. Oh. Um, so I just do those. I don't have a dehydrator, but those you can do in the oven pretty easily just at a really low temperature, slice them really thinly. And those that's like another thing that I agree with you, that those like dried vegetables, even if you, you know, you just have one of them, it kind of adds a little bit of extra flavor. So with apples, you just slice them thin and then do you put anything on them or you just... You can put something on them. I usually do mine on their own, but you can actually, you could put like cinnamon on them. You could even do cinnamon and sugar. You could do cinnamon and powdered ginger. Yeah, and you, so you slice them pretty thinly and then put them on on a baking sheet with either either on parchment paper or like a silicone baking mat just so that they're easy to pull off. And then you you do them at like a 200 degrees for time-wise, just depends on yeah. how thick you've sliced them. But usually I do mine for somewhere in between an hour to two hours and you just flip them over kind of halfway through. And if you really like don't want to pay attention to them, you kind of do them for like an hour at 200 at night and then just turn off the oven and like come back to them the next morning. And then they're a little bit crispier than they usually are. Yum. I usually just buy mine already made at the farmer's market, but I like, yeah. I like your style. <laughs> what about camping? So like you're camping outside with friends and you're just car camping, or maybe you're just hiking in a couple miles and then you're going to camp for the night. What's like a winning recipe or winning meal to bring to share with friends? Well, so I really, so if I'm car camping or yeah, just doing a shorter thing, I really like having an appetizer, like not just the main, the main meal. Cause I think we get so in this, like, oh, here's a one pot meal that we're all going to just slop into our bowls. And that's that. So even if you just have like, even like dried bread, you can slice that up, pour some olive oil on it and just grill it up pretty quickly. And then put like, if you have a little bit of cheese, you can put that on top and just serve it as, you know, little, little squares. Or in the book, there's like a little panini recipe. So just melt you basically any bread that you have, whether it's flatbread or like sandwich bread or tortillas, you know, just putting a little bit of cheese in there with whatever, like apples or bell pepper or, you know, just kind of playing around with that and then just serving that ahead of time. I like that. I think that that makes people like that when you pull out an appetizer at camp, they're like, whoa, that's good advice. Yeah. One of my favorite ones that we ever had was on a bike trip a couple of years ago, we biked down the Pacific coast and we'd been at a farmer's market in uh, Mendocino and we'd bought shishito peppers, which are those kind of <gasps> small green ones. And we, yeah, we just fried those up in some olive oil and like 
I always have sea salt with me. So we just put some sea salt on top of them. And we like, there was some other bike travelers next to us. And we're like, hey, do you guys want some of this? And they were just like, what? <laughs> Which is so, I mean, not a complicated dish. It's just that we happened to pick up some good ingredients on the way. So the book, how did the book go? And what's the feedback you guys have been getting from the book? I always think it's really fun to collaborate on projects. I mean, I think with any creative work, you know, we never create in a vacuum. We're always inspired and influenced by people around us. And it can always be so nice to collaborate with someone because you just get to kind of be pushed and challenged and always think out of the box a little bit more. Um, so it's so fun to work with Brendan. So the, the whole the whole idea for the book was kind of like we both love cooking food outside and just wanted to share that, but in a really sort of down to earth way. And, you know, Brendan is a really funny guy. And so we sort of took this uh, slightly snarky, slightly humorous, um, not taking ourselves too serious approach to the book. For us, I mean, I think both of us, well, I won't speak for Brendan, but I know that for myself, like I've never had a recipe in front of me when I'm cooking outside, right? And I've never had a measuring cup with me. So to actually write a cookbook about cooking outside is actually sort of humorous, just in the sense that that's not how I roll when I'm outdoors. But it was just a fun process to do that together. And then we did a multiple day trip where we just like made a lot of recipes and shot a lot of photos. And by the end of it, we were just like, we can't eat anymore. You know, we would like, we would make a recipe and then it'd be like, okay, we've shot it, but now we need to eat it. <laughs> and we just sort of like overdid it. But it was fun. That sounds really fun, the eating part of it and, and the making of it. it. It all sounds really fun. You know, I don't I don't ever take recipes with me or look at them when I'm cooking, but I'll read them at night when I'm hungry and then I close the book and I get so inspired and make things up. I think that's how most people are, though. I think they would read it. They would not carry it in their backpack, but they would be inspired. Yeah. The one thing that I've actually been debating on making is because I think that the one thing that makes it easier to cook outside is knowing sort of basic ratio guidelines. So I've actually been thinking about making like a little card that you could just like slip in your wallet or just like in the side of your backpack that kind of like, you know, how they have those hang tags for leave no trace. That's like the leave no trace principles just so you like know what they are to do the same thing, but for ratios for for different stuff for cooking it, because I think that's super helpful. Because that's like, you know, you're always like, oh, oatmeal. I mean, how many times have you made oatmeal? And then you're like, wait, how much water do I need? <laughs> wow. That's, I totally agree. Like winging it doesn't always work, especially when you're messing no. <laughs> up like quinoa or rice or. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You can ask Johnny, my partner in the kitchen, how much I mess up rice. Like I'm one of those people that will like pick rice up halfway through and stir it. I, yeah, I do rice so rarely. I always have to look. Like, I just don't even. Looking is and fine. And then I'm like, but, am I doing it but right? But then I stir it, which is like what you're not supposed to do. I think though, like when you're cooking outside, I mean, it's like better to air on too much water than too little. And the other thing that you can do, like when you're cooking pasta or grains, I do a lot on trips is you can pour that water off and it makes like into a container or a mug and it makes really good hot chocolate because it's really nice and starchy afterwards oh. so then you're not like wasting that water so you just add your cacao and your stevia or whatever yeah. to i've it. even i even made it once with like leftover water that i had rehydrated dried mushrooms in and it was really good when it comes to cooking outside just one piece of advice that was either given to you or that you like to give to people i, I love the advice like if it's outside it just tastes good but anything else i think the best thing that you can do to improve your outdoor cooking game is just have a spice kit that is more than pepper and salt. Even if you just have one other thing in there, just find a couple of spices that you really enjoy and spices that are uh, multi-purpose. So it can do both sweet and savory. So like cinnamon and ginger work really well for, for either. And I think that that is just whatever you're making, you can always add a couple of extra spices to it. It's going to taste a lot better. Anna's co-author, Brendan, has been on the show before. He's the creator of Semirad, a website and Instagram account featuring essays and cartoons about adventure, as well as the humor in everyday life. What does this guy know about food? Well, Brendan runs a lot, trains a lot, does ultra marathon, and he eats a lot. So no surprise, I caught up with him while he was out adventuring. So the audio quality is a little rough. So I'm curious, you know, you wrote this great cookbook. What inspired it? I, I actually had wanted to do a project with my friend Anna, and she's, I respect her work in a lot of ways. And we don't really have a lot of crossover in the things we do because I do a lot of 
uh, like climbing, mountaineering, ultra running and stuff. And she doesn't do those things, but she does a lot of uh, backpacking and uh, bike packing. And she's a phenomenal cook and just comes at comes at it. She's written a couple other books about food and she's good at baking and knowing what ingredients to use and what things taste like. And also just very confident, you know, just like one of those people who just starts to throw things together. So we co-wrote a cookbook called Best Served Wild. It's like single day things to snacks you take with you to big things you can make while car camping and then ultralight or, or backpacking food. And I guess I had been maybe one of the stories that sort of inspired us. I was out just on a day hike with a group of friends one time and my friend Mitsu was with us and we sat down at like, I don't know, halfway to eat some lunch. And I had brought something pretty basic, maybe like cliff bars or a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And he had like, I want to say smoked salmon, maybe like capers. Uh, it was the same situation you were talking about earlier where you are eating and you're just trying to get some calories and you look over at somebody else's food and you go, wow, I'm really an amateur, you know? And he is a long time outward bound instructor and has spent hundreds of nights in the wilderness. And he said, oh, I've been doing way too much of this stuff to just eat like energy bars. So I've sort of brought that inspiration with me and thought, how can I, how can I work better food into my life in the outdoors? Yeah, or how hungry you really are and how picky you are. When you did this book, what did you hope people would get out of it? Um, yeah, I mean, just just more joy about food, I think, you know, and like, I think a lot of people kind of food is one of the last things they think of when they're getting ready to go on a trip, maybe and they grab some like freeze dried stuff from when they're at the gear shop. And they're like, do I have my tent? Do I have my sleeping bag? Do I have this? Do I have that? And then food? Oh, what are we gonna do about food? And it can be a little daunting, but I don't think it has to be. I always think of like, what did you cook, you know, when you were a sophomore in college or the first time <laughs> you were living on your own? Like, it was probably really simple. Just make that when you go backpacking. The first thing everybody cooks is macaroni and cheese. And like, of course, yeah, take that backpacking. It's like 800 calories. And all you need is the box, some water. And I think you're supposed to put, I think the, the recipe probably says milk and butter, but I just take out a little jar of olive oil with me, a little plastic, uh, like two ounces of it. And it's great. So what are your favorite recipes? Like, I'd love for you to start diving in and telling us like breakfast, lunch, dinner, an ideal day. Give me a little mix, like a little car camping, something more elaborate, something for really easy, lightweight. For long trips, for backcountry trips that are, you know, a couple days or more, I always have relied on oatmeal to keep it light, but also so you're not just like grudging your way through regular oatmeal i always add um i find powdered peanut butter which is sort of in a lot of grocery stores these days super light but very high in protein so like take a big bag of that some plain or flavored oatmeal packets and then some dried fruit i take uh, goji berries a lot um, and then i add uh, walnuts or pecans or something else to it so it becomes this you can get it up to probably close to 700 and some calories. So that's, that's a solid breakfast, you know, for, for a morning in the back country with not very much weight. Yeah. Goji berries taste like nerds. Like they're so good. But yeah, I mean, dried cherries are really awesome too. And if I don't do powdered peanut butter, if I'm only out for a couple nights, I will take like packets of peanut butter, like Justin's nut butter or uh, trail butter is amazing stuff. I mean, I haven't eaten oatmeal without peanut butter in it for like probably a decade now. And more yummy. That sounds so good. Oh, it's so good. Yeah. My whole life I've been missing out. Sometimes I put almond butter, but yeah, what am I doing every time now? I mean, cashew butter if you're really fancy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty fancy. I like that. So we got breakfast. We got oatmeal with like peanut butter and some goji berries. Well, we should talk about coffee, I suppose, huh? Oh, yes. Do you That's drink coffee? That's the most important meal of the day. It's pretty much all I eat for breakfast. Yeah. So, you know, for a lot, a lot of people will do a lot of different things with coffee. And in the back country, I'm pretty lazy. I will just also instant coffee has, you know, come leaps and bounds in the last 10 years. I'm really into Alpine Start 
which is a Boulder company. And they make, they make it's, it's similar to Via. You know, it's just good coffee, micro ground and freeze dried. Um, so it tastes really good. But they have a coconut creamer latte. They're kind of big packets. I always say it's the size of a tampon, which is like not. <laughs> that's pretty much how big. It's so random hearing this from you. I know. But that's what it looks like when I throw it in a bag. I'm like, what are these things? But they're, that's one of my favorite things right now. Because you can't really, some people will take milk in the back country, but I think it's sort of a oh, gross. not great idea. And I, I use half and half of my coffee, but um, Laird Hamilton has this like. I was just going to say superfoods, Laird Hamilton. For those of you who don't know, Laird's a pro surfer, husband of past guest Gabby Reese. And he has this line of plant-based creamers, coffees, and other yummy stuff. Yeah, he has a coconut creamer that works pretty well too. But so far, as far as simplicity goes. I go the Alpine Start coconut cream or latte. But yeah, that's that's coffee. And lunch, gosh, in the backcountry, it can sort of be anything. I might do like a variety of sort of like trail mixes or tortillas and other things. My favorite thing to do for single day things, well, there's, there's two things now, um, is to take a frozen breakfast burrito from just like the freezer section of the supermarket or say a 7-Eleven. And just keep that in my backpack and let it thaw throughout the day. Isn't it soggy? No. By the time you're on top of the peak or whatever, whenever you, your lunch point, you have this like lukewarm breakfast burrito, which I think is phenomenal. It's, I, I love it. Um, so I, I eat those actually when I do super long trail runs as well or ultra marathons. I'll, I'll pack just thawed breakfast burritos and, and eat them a half a burrito at a time just to get some real calories. And also... I learned this trick from a mountain guide in the Sierras. I did this uh, four-day Mount Whitney climb for for a fundraiser. So it was a bunch of us and on, on a guided trip. And we, we were there. And, and like day three or four, I asked this guide, Chris, like, every day I look over here at lunch, I see you eating a slice of pizza. What, how did you, what are you doing? Did you just pack a whole pizza back here? And he goes, oh, yeah. The night before these four-day trips, I will just buy a frozen pizza at the supermarket, bake it, and then I'll cut it into you know four slices and then every day i have a slice of pizza on this trip and i thought oh my god this guy's a genius you know so i did this on my like my last ultra marathon i I, like made two vegan pizzas cut them in half and folded them into like basically quesadillas and put them in plastic bags and every time i met back up with my wife at an aid station i'd grab one and just walk off eating pizza i'm like this is this is fantastic and it's 400 400 500 calories for that. So that's, that's one of my favorite lunch things to do. So dinner, this is the one that I think it's the hardest one, I think for most people. Yeah. There's a lot of things like we, we typically go to pasta, right? Like as far as like what we're going to use, like rice or some sort of pasta noodles or anything. And, and you look at the directions on a bag of pasta and it says to boil it for eight to 11 minutes for al dente pasta. And you think, Gosh, that's a lot of gas I have to take backpacking. Um, you know, and it, it would get pretty heavy if you were just going to boil your pasta all the way through. But uh, I learned a trick from a, a friend. I think my first camping trip ever, he had, he had through hiked the Appalachian Trail and he was cooking Annie's macaroni and cheese for dinner. And he's like, yeah, I just bring it to a boil, boil it for one minute, turn the gas off, leave the lid on and let it sit for nine minutes. And then it's done. And it was it was a revelation for me like wow you don't actually have to cook it it's just literally it's like soaking in warm water and it's totally fine genius that's a good hack i appreciate that one so most of your dinners are are pasta or rice how do you make it like really yummy i mean you can add soup vegetables pieces of cheese i always take hot sauce or you take hot sauce with you on your trips oh totally they actually are selling like single serving sriracha packets at REI now. Like you can buy a bag of like 50 of them. Wow, that's a good to know. REI for the win and sriracha. Well done on making those. How about dessert? Like I've got a chocolate sweet tooth always for pretty much every meal. I want chocolate afterwards. Do you have like any dessert -y I recipes? Would do like hard candies, or we have recipes to make like cookies and stuff in our cookbook, but I usually would get things that can't break very easily, like Paul Newman's miniature chocolate chip cookies. Those things are incredibly durable in a backpack. Harder chocolate candies, like dark chocolate M&Ms and stuff like that. So we'll rely on those. 
any tricks for gear? So and cooking as far tools? as like little containers to pack stuff in, Nalgene makes this. It's like a kit of, I want to say five or six really small bottles. And that works pretty well to pour olive oil into. And I still have really never found a, a, like a 100% watertight olive oil container. So I, what I end up doing is a small plastic jar with a screw on lid and then put that inside a plastic bag because it's going to leak anyway. There are these old school, the company that makes them is Coughlin's and you'll see them in REI. They make all kinds of stuff. Like I think they make a, uh, like a campfire grilled cheese maker thing. But what I use is these refillable tubes. So it's essentially like a toothpaste tube with no closure on the back end. And you, you put this little pinching thing on it and you can take a ton of peanut butter back in the back country with those. And then I do everything with like a, like the basic $1 REI Lexan spoon, you know, and I will like saw off the end of the handle so it fits in my pot set. So I don't have to, so I won't lose it. And I have this basic MSR pot set that I got when I was working at a nonprofit 10 years ago, I've had this pot set for 10 years and it's two pots and that's it. One handle that's shared between the two pots, one lid that's shared between the two pots. And depending on the complexity of the trip I'm going on, I just take that. And then stoves, I have been using the MSR Whisper Light Universal. It takes canister fuel, butane, and also white gas. And I like it because it's freestanding. It doesn't sit on top of a gas canister. And the little the little stoves you can buy that will perch on top of a gas canister are fine, but they're really, in my opinion, inefficient because you can't even build a windscreen for them. So you just have this like canisters sitting out with a pot on top of it, the wind's blowing by and it's just like sucking all the heat off of your, off of your stove. So tough to cook with. And then car camping. I know people make really nice two burner stoves, but I like, I will stand by the, the two burner Coleman stove that I think is like, maybe it's $55, but like, yeah, you can spend a couple hundred bucks on a camp stove or you can get this Coleman stove that's worked for, I don't know if, 30 years, you know, for 55 bucks. And they sell those green gas canisters at like every hardware store in Walmart in America. So if you're in the middle of nowhere and realize you don't have any gas or you need more gas, you can go get some. And those things like for my needs have worked for, for years. Any tips you can give to people who just, you know, want to make their own food for a multi-day backpacker camping trip that you're just like, here's a, couple tenants yeah. to remember. You know, you can take a pretty basic recipe for a lot, a lot of different things and just make it and, and make it work for the back country. You just have to think of, okay, can I dehydrate the vegetables or can I buy dehydrated vegetables or can I substitute something that will, that will be, I can carry without having it weigh 10 pounds and pastas are always good. You can always find dried soup, vegetables, things like that. And I, I mean, I think the number one tip I would have is like, even if it's not, doesn't look like it's that good. If you make it at home, when you are 10 miles from any road, it's going to taste pretty good. I love that Anna and Brendan's book, Best Served Wild, doesn't take itself too seriously because it's true. I certainly don't want to bring a cookbook and look at recipes when I'm cooking in the great outdoors. It's all about finding inspiration and putting it to use in the ways it works best for you. When we come back, we talk to Bon Appetit magazine editor and YouTube star Brad Leone about getting the best ingredients and in making the perfect camp kitchen setup. When you spend time outside, there's things you just can't find anywhere else, like the whistle of wet wood on a bonfire, the feeling of belonging you have just by being out there, or a river rock that surprisingly looks like the station wagon your parents drove when you were a kid. REI is here to help you find those things and more, to ask big questions and discover more answers outside wherever you are. So visit your local store or REI.com for inspiration to get outdoors and tools to make it easier. Then go find out. Brad Leone has had quite a career, from working at his grandfather's catering company to carpentry to deciding to go to culinary school. Out of school, he got a job as a prep cook and dishwasher at Bon Appetit Magazine's Test Kitchen 
and he's been there ever since. In 2016, the magazine started a YouTube series called It's Alive with Brad, featuring, you guessed it, Brad and his passion for fermented foods. The show has grown quite a bit. Most of his videos get around 2 million views, and he now has a spin-off series where he travels around to meet people working in or educating others about food. Here's a clip of Brad on his most recent episode where he went to Hawaii to go spear fishing with previous Wild Ideas Worth Living guest, Kimmy Warner. I am such a fan of some of the smaller fish, what the industry considers a bycatch or like a nuisance. But like, you know, we can't all just eat tuna and salmon. No, no. I think the key to sustainability is diversifying our choices. And especially when you go low on the food chain, that's like the most responsible way you can be eating. And, And like you said, if globally, you know, we're all collectively targeting the same four fish, obviously that's not a good idea. We're not gonna have any more. If you've ever seen It's Alive with Brad, you can see the kind of joy Brad gets from cooking his food and eating it and from just being out in nature. He even did a few episodes all about cooking over a campfire. It's Alive is so good. It's like a cross between a travel show, a food show, a comedy show. Yeah, we started, you know, it's just been It's Alive, which is in the kitchen. And that's like a lot of fermentation and projects. And then uh, we started to dabble with with some traveling and uh, going to different farms and seeing where food comes from and the people behind it and the stories behind it. And that's that's really kind of where my passion lies and how that can, you know, and then being an outdoorsy guy, you know, it all just kind of. I don't know, it just works and it just makes me makes me happy. And uh, that's where our second show, It's Alive Going Places, kind of was born from. And that's where we go to one location or, you know, an area and do four episodes, like a little mini series. And uh, that really dives into the, the travel and the people behind the food, farmers and chefs and, you know, craftsmen of, of different types. And, uh, yeah, we were actually just down in Hawaii. And, uh, man, that was, the, that was the most recent episodes that are, that are out now. And it was, that was fantastic. Fantastic. We did some spear fishing and uh, wild boar hunt and the traditional like a pig roast, a luau, and um, it was just you know the, it, the food almost became an afterthought and it really was about the people and you know the, and the experiences you're having with the people while you're doing it and the friends you're making and the stuff you're learning you know and all while being you know surrounded by nature and I mean if I could do that if I could tell people stories like that for a living I mean I couldn't I couldn't be happier. So you're like a legit outdoors guy. You spearfish now, you fly fish, you camp, (laughs) you surf. Yeah, jack of all, master of none, basically. But uh, <laughs> no, that's not true. I mean, I'm pretty good at fishing. Uh, I can. I've caught some some really fun waves, but I'm I'm certainly no. Uh, I know my limits and my skill level too. I just love doing it, you know. And it's like that old saying: the the best surfer is the one having the most fun, or whatever. I'm not always having the most fun, but when I do, I, I get it. You know, it's when you catch that wave and you get in the right spot and you're just kind of cruising down the down the line there with all that power behind you. It's just I mean, there's. There's nothing like it. And the more I get into different types of outdoors and sports and stuff, you find the little things in each that are, that are, that are kind of like getting in that right pocket when you're surfing. And, uh, you know, the more things I can do that can give me that feeling while I'm being in nature, you know, life's too short. I just want to do them all, really. Yeah. So you gardened and you're pretty close to, you know, land, just being interested in food and wanting to get close to the source of where food comes from. But tell me a little bit about your camping experience and maybe eating outside as a kid growing up. Yeah, I mean, I guess my dad was like a real big outdoorsy guy. So that's kind of where I got it from. You know, we were always going fishing and frogging and snapping turtle catching and pheasant hunting, deer hunting. So like, I really got that from him. And then cooking outside, I mean, yeah, I mean, he dabbled a little bit. He always had like the outdoor burner going, you know, like the propane burner and he'd make jambalaya and, you know, and, and stuff like that and smoking fish and stuff. And um, if I, co- I started really to develop it, the outdoor cooking, like building a kitchen outside, kind of on my own, just with some friends and stuff. And uh, yeah, it's, it's one of my favorite things to do. So already your dad was really advanced. I mean, most people, when they cook outside, it's like hot dogs and s'mores. Yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, I ate, you know, 
I ate well when I was when I was exposed to good food. I mean, we always we we had hot dogs and stuff like that too. I never really liked s'mores, but uh, <laughs> you don't like s'mores. I like the chocolate of the s'mores. Yeah, I mean, I I like I like it all. I like it deconstructed. I like each of the flavors. Yeah. And I even like them together. I just never really got into the the whole the campfire dessert activity. It was never that good. I felt like it could have been made better. Well, tell me really quickly about this outdoor kitchen because I've watched an episode of you and you built this outdoor kitchen and it was like. I mean, it was pretty legit. It wasn't, there weren't too many tools that would have been hard to carry in, even if you're backpacking far. But like just to make an outdoor kitchen is, is really, that concept is pretty interesting. And I'd, I'd love you to share a little bit about that and tips to making food outdoors just taste awesome. Yeah, well, I, it's kind of, I think the key to making good outdoor food is you, you can do a lot of prep at home and just have a really good solid you know broken down pantry of things that you can bring into the into the woods that could take you know a piece of meat or a piece of you know whatever some vegetables and can just really bring it to another level you know like like some fermented chili paste or uh different types of soy sauce or misos or just things that have big umami it is, is always a i find to be super helpful and then just having like the right tools you know i just like things to be real lightweight cooking on um like those wire resting racks and then, I mean, it could be as complicated as you want it to be. It starts to get to find the right spot somewhere. Usually, if you can get a little wind protection, that's really nice. And then just go gather a bunch of rocks. And what I like to do is build like a big U and then like a strip down the center of more rocks. So it's kind of like a like a, like an M, I guess we'll say. <laughs> yeah, so like it would be like almost like an M. So you can have – you could build in the back. You, have, you can build a fire, okay? And then in the front of it, when you get the two – you know, the two – channels coming down and these are all rock structures you could have your little fire pit you know and that's where you let the wood burn down and then when you because you don't want to cook over burning logs you know you want hot coals so as that starts to burn down you can scrape them into your your two channels i mean heck you could build 15 channels if you want you know but two usually works or three depending on how much you're cooking or just one but i like to be able to control where you can just have a big burn pile where you know a, a charcoal factory as i like to call it and they can just pull forward what you need and that it gives you a great opportunity to control the heat too so I try to do that, and it kind of started with just me and my buddies just hiking in, and we'd bring all kinds of wild stuff in, you know, lobsters and shrimp and, you know, things that you normally wouldn't cook out in the woods. And uh, Yum. Yeah, I mean, you go for a good, you know, a decent little hike, and you're out in the middle of nowhere, and you're eating food like that that you could, you know, easily buy, you know, in a fancy restaurant and for a lot of money. And, uh, yeah, it's just, a, I think, just think it's a real fun way to, to celebrate food. Doesn't food just taste different outdoors? Yeah, well, you're usually working a lot harder for it. So, so I mean, I think, like, uh, it's always better when you earn it, right? I think there's that element. And, yeah, there's something just about being in nature uh, that I think – and you're cooking it. You're usually – you know, pr it's usually pretty primitive or with your hands. And you got, you got your smoke. You burned your fingertips. You know, it's like when you sit down and eat it, it's just, A, the food's probably awesome. I hope so anyway. But, like, like I'm saying, the whole experience, I think, really feeds into it too. So what are a few recipes – or meals that people can cook outdoors that might blow away their guests. Yeah, I mean, a big favorite of mine, you know, if you can bring a walk out, you know, if you're just doing like, if you're, especially if you're camping out of a car, or I mean, they're not really that heavy. You could probably, you could probably strap it on the side of a pack or something, but like going out and bringing some pre cooked rice and some vegetables and just making like a real hot fried rice out in the woods, that's, that's a pretty, that's a pretty satisfying one to do. And then just less is more. I, I would focus more on getting really awesome ingredients and just cooking, cooking them perfectly in a simple way. Some good olive oil, some good salt, you know, uh, a little vinegar if you want or some citrus or, you know, just having uh, letting the things that you're cooking kind of speak for it. Good olive oil, good salt. Is there any other spices that just like work really well outside? Yeah, you know what I always tend to bring with me is like a, like a, a seedless pepper flake, like a Marasp beer or like, a, like a, an Aleppo style chili flake, you know, a seedless flake. It just goes on everything so nice and it, it bleeds a little color and that flavor into it. It's just, it's just a fantastic staple to, to bring outside. Or sometimes, you know, I'll do like back home, speaking about prep before, I'll make like a little, like a little half pint container or something or, you know, whatever kind of container you got. And I'll back when I'm home and I have all these different spices and I'll make like a master, uh, like a master mix, you know, and I'll put like salt, little cumin, some, uh, you know, I don't hate a little garlic powder. 
and I'll, you know, I'll put a little seaweed in or something, whatever I'm cooking. And then you have this like master, like thing that just kind of flash on the, you know, pick and choose. You don't put it on everything. You don't want the, the meal to be the same tone, but like, you know, you get my point. Yeah. It just so beats like my rice cake and almond butter. Hey, then, you know, time honey. and a place, you know, <laughs> time and a place. That, that, I'm sure you've had that rice cake and almond butter and it was the best one you ever had in your life. I don't know. Maybe in Yosemite at the top. But yeah. so what about your favorites to just take while you're actually kind of hiking in? Is there anything that's pretty lightweight that you've enjoyed? Yeah, I mean, one of my favorite things to absolutely bring out in the woods is uh, tin fish. Or, you know, some, some of the companies now do like, and then there's like vacuum bags where it's like cooked, you know, smoked sardines. Oh, yeah. or Patagonia or tr- does something. Patagonia like does the, the vacuum bags. I love that. They can just bring like little crackers or like a, a chunk of bread or something. And I mean, that's pretty lightweight. And it's got, you know, it's got, I think it's just good clean energy too. I'm a big fan of dried mangoes and, and, and you know nuts and fruit. So I'll just take a bunch of those different things. And, and, and throw them in a different, you know, like a pouch or something and uh, always nibble at that if we're trying to go super light. Different jerkies are pretty, I, I find them to be pretty uh, pretty useful on, out in the woods too. Or, you know, if you're doing something outside where, where you just need a quick snack, that's kind of a go-to. I'm not a real big sweets guy, but that's probably a good thing. Yeah, you're lucky. I was like, where's the chocolate in this? But Hey, listen, I love a little, I like dark chocolate. Yeah, me too. I can get into that. I can nibble, I can nibble that a lot. And that actually, that's a good point. I think that would be... I don't do it that often because it always tends to like melt in my bag or my pocket or something. But, True. Uh, but the chocolate is a, is a fantastic one. And pretty, I think it'd be pretty good, pretty good, you know, fast energy for you too, right? So you've played around with fermentation a lot on your show and just in your work. Is there any way to, you know, bring fermented foods to increase the flavor of food outdoors or yeah, is I that think, something? I think fermented products are great that bring on a camping trick, especially long term or even short term. Because, I mean, the way fermentation kind of started, you know, A, by accident, but also, you know, it was kind of before there was refrigeration and they wanted to make things last longer. And it was kind of to, to give it a, you know, a shelf life. So they would ferment things. And so to my point, you don't need to worry about a cooler or ice packs or something. You could take some sauerkraut, put it in a bag and throw it in your pack and like, you're good, man. And you go, you know, cook a little food a little bit and then you got your probiotics on you and you're doing all right. That, I think that's a great idea. I should, I, I got to start doing more of that. <laughs> you're awesome. Tools to bring when you're going, you know, just for like car camping or just like a short hike. You said walk. I've seen you use an axe to cut wood, like any other like couple of just tools that you should have on hand. Yeah, thin, a thin, lightweight hatchet is really, really helpful. I'm a big fan of the, uh, of the headlamp. You never know when it starts getting a little darker. You know, uh, it's really nice to have your, your hands free. I mean, I bring one of those things everywhere. Yeah, and then a knife. I mean, as far as a knife goes, I like to, you know, so many, you know, you think of a knife, it's like this big pointy chef's knife. I like to bring like a Japanese or Chinese uh, vegetable cleaver. You know, it's got the flat end. They're workhorses. You can do like anything with them. That is, and they're easy to pack. And uh, that that is my, they're my go-to knife, but that is definitely my go-to uh, like next level outdoor knife. Fourth of July is coming up. Everybody wants to take something that's pretty exciting maybe impress their friends or, you know, just impress themselves. Do you have any recipes that you could share just to help people have an enhanced 4th of July meal? Well, I mean, yeah, yeah. I, what I like to get, you know, I'm a big fish and seafood guy by, you know, right out of the gate, but I like to get a nice big chunk of fish if you're going to have some people over and, you know, like a, a big chunk of halibut or, you know, uh, I'm on a big yellow tail, like hamachi kick. I, that could be a little difficult for some folks to find, but depending where you live, Maybe not. Just, a, you know, where you can get some, a big slab of it with the skin on and just cook it whole. I mean, I think that is, and then, you know, like I said before, less is more. I think they let the, you know, simplicity sometimes can really, you know, be some of the best dishes. So uh, a big chunk of fish. A big chunk of fish. And then what do you do with it? All right. So what I've been doing recently, if you can get like a big piece of steel or like a big cast iron and just, I like to lay it down, you know, skin down and let that skin kind of act as a protective barrier and even crisp up. And you can either finish it in the oven or just leave it out on the grill or, you know, on a flat top. Yeah, it really, it really depends on you know, what kind of tools you got. But uh, 
just getting that skin nice and crispy and just don't overcook your fish. And you know, I think that's the biggest thing people do is they overcook it. You see salmon so, so often and people, I, I don't like fish. It's usually because I have a bad experience and it's, it's hammered to hell. And it, you know, it all starts at the boat, right? So like if you get, you should, when it comes to anything, you got to try to get the best you can get. Get the best ingredients and then don't overcook it. Don't overcook it, yeah. The little less is more in terms of seasoning. Yeah, I mean, with, with the fish, I don't go, I mean, to each their own. Hey, if you want to, if you want to go cover it in, you know, teriyaki sauce, knock yourself out. I mean, I'm sure it'll be delicious. But, you know, if I got an, I like to taste the fish. So I just do a little bit of salt, a little olive oil, a little lemon if you want. Sometimes I'll do a little bit of honey if you want to get just a little hint of sweet on it. Yeah, but nothing crazy. I don't like to do nothing too crazy. Uh, steamed fish is fantastic. Get yourself a big slab of fish. Or like a or a bunch of little small ones. I'm just over fillets is what I'm. I, I want like something with the bones in it. You can cook it whole. You waste so much when you throw away the whole body. You just you know cut out the fillet. Let it cook on the bones. And people, some people get worried. Oh, I don't want to eat the bones. But actually, when it's once it's perfectly cooked, the meat just kind of falls off the bones. I've had more bones in fillets than I've had eaten a whole fish. You know, and uh, so much more flavor and juice when you cook it on the bones too. So. Whole fish. And, and get something other than tuna and salmon. Got it. That's, that's great advice. And what if you're like a vegan? Uh, well, then eat vegetables. You're like, I can't help you. <laughs> no. I'm, I, lo- I mean, I love vegetables. Uh, get some eggplant or something. Big eggplant guy. Fourth of July, I guess it might be a little early for some places. Out here, it's more of an August thing. But you're getting close. I think grilled eggplant is fantastic. I like cooking things on big flat tops, like big ponches, where you can get a nice even consistency, uh, you know, sear all over. You get some of those uh, like Japanese eggplants and just rub it with a little mirin and miso and sear it up. Oh man, I mean, if someone, sh- I wouldn't care if there wasn't meat, as long as you, you know, if you get good vegetables and, and, and prepare them right. That sounds delicious. Any parting words of wisdom for people who want to cook food but are like a little intimidated? Yeah, don't be scared. Do it. Have fun. And don't overthink it. I feel like people, I feel like everyone knows how to cook. You just got to stop overthinking it. We're exposed to so much this and that and, you know, new people, you know, all these fancy things. Or, but it's really, it can be as simple as you want it to be. And, uh, and just have fun doing it. So as summer kicks into high gear and we all start preparing for various adventures, maybe you're car camping with your family, maybe you're hiking the PCT, maybe you're on a surf trip, it's important to keep yourself nourished. But it's also important to make every part of your trip as fun and as easy as it can be. I hope these three guests have given you some inspiration for your next outdoor meal, whether it's out of the trunk of your car or buried at the bottom of your pack. I know I'm going to be updating my spice kit and finding those sriracha packs and maybe even stirring some macadamia nut or almond butter back into my oatmeal. This podcast is produced by REI with help from Annie Fassler and Chelsea Davis. Thanks so much to Brendan Leonard, to Anna Branis, and to Bradley One, who are all due for a surf adventure when you guys get to San Diego. And thank you so much to Diana Wade for making such yummy food on our first camping adventure with the La Jolla High Surf Team. Tune in week after next for a conversation with the director of an empowering documentary about pro surfer Bethany Hamilton. As always, we appreciate when you subscribe, rate, and review the show wherever you listen. We've been getting fantastic reviews, and some of you have a wicked sense of humor. I really appreciate them, and they really do help the show grow. Wherever you are, I hope you enjoy your meal. And remember, some of the best adventures often happen when you follow your wildest ideas. Thank you.